Okay, so uh, we are going to continue our discussion in this lecture, load instability and tearing. Uh, so, uh, in the uh, uh, last session, uh, we discussed about uh, uh, you know the meaning of uh, imperfection that you can give in the sheet, and then uh, what is the use of that, and then we derived an equation for n minus epsilon u. Okay, it's a function of imperfection severity that is dA naught and n strain learning exponent, right? So we'll continue our discussion in this session. So uh, next one, what we are going to see is the effect of rate sensitivity or strain rate sensitivity. Okay, so we understand this uh, particular uh, topic. Rate sensitivity means uh, uh, how sensitive is your is our deformation with respect to change in strain rate. Slowly or quickly you do the test. So how is going to affect the uh, deformation okay uh, or instability development or uh, limit strains okay so uh, that is what uh, the main aim here is uh, but until now what we have assumed is basically the material actually strain hardens okay and uh, mostly it's insensitive to strain rate mostly it is insensitive to strain rate that's what we were assuming but uh, that can happen in uh, room temperature okay but the problem is uh, when necking starts, then the effect of strain rate is going to become uh, significant during that process, during that localization or necking process. Even at room temperature, when you assume the strain rate effect to be small, okay, but uh, if you see that once necking starts, uh, then uh, the effect of strain rate is going to be significant. So, uh, we cannot actually neglect the effect of uh, strain rate, okay, uh, because uh, when necking starts, we will see that in due course that there is going to be uh, unstable increase in one of the strains and you will see that that is going to be a reason for material failure. Okay. So, now uh, let us assume a material which is actually non-strain hardening, but it follows uh, this particular strain rate, uh, you know, flow stress model, flow stress relationship sigma 1 is equal to B into epsilon 1 dot power m, where m is called as strain rate sensitivity index. So, we are not bringing in n here, strain hardening exponent n okay, uh, is not available in this equation, which is a general equation that we have seen before. Generally, we have seen that equation before, but right now we are using sigma is equal to b epsilon dot power m, that type of equation we are saying. And here, you know that m is called strain rate sensitivity index, we know how to get this, uh, you know, material property. Okay. And uh, here, so uh, b is actually a fit constant, like what we see as k in case of Holloman power law equation. So, here you will see that epsilon 1 dot is nothing but a true strain rate which can be defined as d epsilon 1 divided by dt. Okay, that means, rate of change of uh, your major strain okay, that is defined by epsilon 1 dot is nothing but d epsilon 1 divided by dt which is equal to dl by l divided by t and dl by l is nothing but your cross set velocity that you use for tensile test and it is nothing but v by l where V is nothing but your cross head velocity and L is nothing but your instantaneous gauge length okay, uh, during tensile test. So, you can get true strain rate from these two values. Okay. Uh, so, you can see that epsilon 1 dot depends on a cross head speed and the gauge length, instantaneous gauge length L. Why? Because it is a true strain rate. Okay. So, now let us again go back to our this particular diagram which you have discussed in the previous class. So, you have a sheet with imperfection at this particular position let us say okay, and uh, it is getting deformed. So, it is a uniform region, it is imperfect region. So, now the load can be written as P is equal to sigma 1 A which is equal to sigma 1 plus A sigma 1 into A plus D A. Okay. So, this will give uh, the relationship D sigma 1 by sigma 1 is equal to minus D A by A and uh, you will see that. Uh, uh, when you have uh, uh, this particular equation, you will see that the difference in stress in these two regions that is d sigma 1, uh, that is this d sigma 1 is proportional to the magnitude of imperfection, is proportional to the magnitude of imperfection defined by dA. So, larger the severity of imperfection, you will have a, a large difference uh, in the sigma 1 values between the uh, necked region which is nothing but an imperfect region and the neighboring region which is nothing but a uniform region. Okay. So, now what we are going to do is, uh, that is what I have discussed here, difference in stress for the two regions is proportional to the, okay, your magnitude of imperfection which is nothing but dA. So, now as usual what I am going to do is, uh, I am going to use this particular material law, 
okay and uh, i am going to get a condition okay so now if i differentiate the material law okay and if i put the differentiate the material law i will uh, get a condition for uh, my uh, you know this particular change in strain rate with respect to the strain rate which is nothing but d epsilon 1 divided by epsilon 1 dot is equal to 1 by m d sigma 1 by m uh, sigma 1 by sigma 1 is equal to minus 1 by m d a by a okay so uh, you have to differentiate this okay and you can substitute here you will get this particular equation d epsilon 1 dot divided by epsilon 1 dot is nothing but 1 by m d sigma 1 by sigma 1 and d sigma 1 sigma 1 is nothing but minus d a by a and minus d a by a you can substitute here you will get this, this particular relationship and m is nothing but my strain rate sensitivity index okay so now this equation is going to tell you certain important observation for a smaller value of m okay you will see that the difference in strain rate okay the difference in strain rate will be large and the imperfection will go rapidly okay so difference in strain rate means between these two regions there is an imperfect region there is a perfect region okay let us see there is an imperfect region okay and there is a perfect region okay this is your neck let us say which is a imperfection we have and this is a neighboring region which is a uniform region okay you will see that the difference in strain rate between these two okay is proportional to m in this fashion okay so smaller value of m which is generally seen in room temperature for most of the materials okay at room temperature if you evaluate m it's going to be pretty small you will see that there is going to be large difference in strain rate between this region and this region if you measure it there will be large difference in strain rate between this region this region which is actually uh, one important reason for imperfection to grow rapidly so this neck will be uh, further localized and you will have a fracture as quickly as possible if m is low which is what you see in a room temperature type of deformation okay but there are some materials like super plastic materials where m is going to be very large of the order of let us say 0.3 you will see that the extension could be several hundred percent as a growth of imperfection is very gradual so for the neck to have to become severe and you need to have a fracture in that particular failure in that particular uh, you know location due to localization of neck you will see that uh, m plays a larger role and for those materials which has got pretty large m value okay you will have several hundred percentage of elongation or extension why because uh, the uh, neck growth is actually going to be very gradual the imperfection growth is going to be very gradual which is just opposite to what you have seen in this particular cases for conventional material which are not super plastic in nature you will see that it will grow rapidly so that is why these super plastic materials are generally having very high ductility of the order of let us say 100 percentage sometimes 300 percentage why because it controls epsilon t minus epsilon u okay so uh, epsilon t minus epsilon u is controlled by m that's why we were saying that it is going to control the post necking phenomenon which is actually going to control uh, the growth of neck whether it's going to grow rapidly or slowly gradually so some metals uh, you know people found out that uh, like molten glass which has got m of the order of 1 okay almost equal to 1 can deform almost indefinitely okay so in materials with lower m value rate sensitivity will not greatly influence the maximum uniform strain okay but it will affect post uniform elongation okay okay uh, in which materials uh, with higher grade, uh, higher rate sensitivity uh, will show higher post uniform elongation so necking will be affected by rate sensitivity okay so though maximum uniform elongation is not getting affected but around that particular stage you will see necking is going to start and that will be affected by rate sensitivity and it is found that the post uniform elongation we said that is epsilon t minus epsilon u is higher in which materials having greater rate sensitivity okay so through this simple analysis one can uh, study the uh, effect of uh, strain rate sensitivity index on the growth of neck okay so now the point here is uh, as we said that in the neck region uh, your strain rate is going to be very large as compared to the outside region so one can develop theories based on that to predict your limit strains or instability strains so now what we are going to discuss in this section is called as instability tensile instability in stretching a continuous sheet so when we say continuous sheet it means that uh, for example a conventional sheet which is undergoing deformation through tools like punch okay so generally sheets are deformed by punch 
okay, which will give some geometric constraint on the development of strain distribution in the sheet. Okay, so like punch can change the strain distribution and the contact can change the strain distribution because there is some geometric constraint given to the sheets. Okay, so you will see that in, when we stretch a continuous sheet, you know the, uh, the standard way we do it. Okay, uh, so you will see that a localized neck will develop in that location where diffuse neck was was there before. Okay, so like what we see in the case of tensile strip, and in that situation, generally it is found that uh, width of local neck. Okay, suppose if you measure width of local neck, is almost equal to that of your sheet thickness. Okay, and uh, it is so localized that it generally does not affect the overall strain di distribution outside that region. Okay, so now what will happen because of such localization? Okay, quick tearing can occur in that situations, and your entire process will be over. The overall formability will be lost in that. So if you want to analyze that, we as usual we take a, a sheet uh, uh, with uh, uh, undergoing deformation in this state of stress. You have sigma one, sigma two. Sigma 3 is generally considered as 0 because of plane stress and sigma 1 will give raise to T1, sigma 2 will give raise to T2 for a particular thickness, you can get these values and that is what set of stress and strain is actually represented here for a proportional process. Okay. Of course, you have sigma 1 and sigma 2 is obtained by sigma 2 is equal to alpha into sigma 1, sigma 3 is 0, you have epsilon 1, epsilon 2 is beta and epsilon 1 and epsilon 3 will be equal to minus of 1 plus beta and epsilon 1 which you have already derived and principal traction can be obtained by T1 is equal to sigma 1 into T and T2 is equal to sigma 2 into T which is nothing but alpha into T1. These are all we already discussed and one can get data from this. So now what we are going to do is we are going to put a condition for local necking. We are going to put a condition for evaluate a condition for local necking and as usual we are going to use maximum tension for that. So, we are saying that necking will to some extent start, okay, onset of necking okay, is assumed to start when the major tension reaches a maximum value which is represented by this particular equation. Okay. So, we are saying that dt1 by t1 and t1 is actually a function of sigma1 and t. So, you can write d sigma1 by sigma1 plus dt by t which is nothing but dt by t is nothing but d epsilon 3, d epsilon 3 is nothing but minus of 1 plus beta into d epsilon 1. With this, this entire equation can be framed. Now, what happens when the tension reach maximum? We are going to put this equation to be equal to 0. When we set it, we can get 1 by d epsilon 1 or d sigma 1 divided by d epsilon 1 into 1 by sigma 1 will be equal to 1 plus beta. Is not it? So, if you put this equation to be equal to 0, you will get this particular uh, equation 1 by sigma 1 d sigma by d epsilon 1 is equal to 1 plus beta and this equation is actually known to us before. Okay. In considered condition, we have also get this type of equation and we in the left hand side we call it as a, a normalized strain hardening uh, you know parameter okay. 1 by sigma 1 d sigma 1 by d epsilon 1 is equal to 1 plus beta. Okay. So, here as usual your beta is nothing but your strain ratio. Okay, depending on beta values, one can get this condition and uh, you will see that this equation is valid. It is very important. This equation is valid only for those process in which beta is going to be greater than minus 1. Why? Because during this process, we can expect thinning. We can expect thinning. So, this diagram you have to refer. Okay. So, beta is equal to minus 1, minus of 0, 1. Okay. In all this process, you will get some sort of thinning in the sheet while deforming. Only in those process this equation is valid and if you go in this direction, the one which is going to thicken okay, below this, in this zone, if you pick up, okay, this equation is not valid. Why? For a simple reason that if it is a strain hardening material, the tension will never reach a maximum in this case. Tension will never reach a maximum and we are putting a condition here, no, maximum tension is reached. Okay, maximum major tension is reached. That is not going to happen in this type of situations where your beta is less than minus 1. Okay. Why? Because it is going to thicken. On the other hand, if it is a strain hardening material, then further it is going to complicate the situation. The tension will never reach a maximum. So, you cannot put this condition. This condition is valid in all these situations okay, when you have beta greater than minus 1. Okay. The form of the equation is already known. Only thing is in the previous equation we got, uh, in the previous model we got 1 by sigma 1 d sigma 1 is equal to 1. Okay. And then we applied sigma is equal to uh, is equal to k epsilon 1 power n we applied is not it and then we got epsilon u is equal to n 
okay, if you remember that. Okay, but here the only change is becomes a function of beta now. Okay. So now as usual, we say that for a material obeying a power law like sigma bar is equal to k epsilon bar power n, and for one mass material, this can be written as okay, sigma one is equal to k epsilon one power n. And here I just mentioned k dash because k dash could be a function of k and alpha and beta. Ah, k could be a function of k strain uh, strength coefficient, n strain Hornet exponent, stress ratio and strain ratio. Okay. So, if you want to use the original form of the equation, still one can use. Now, what our problem is, now you have to, if you differentiate this particular equation and put a condition, you will see that 1 by sigma 1, d sigma 1 by d epsilon 1 will be equal to n by epsilon 1, n by epsilon 1. So, it is going to be a, a similar derivation as we did before. Okay, only thing is like on the right hand side you have n by epsilon 1. So, now both the you know uh, left hand sides are equal 1 by sigma 1 d sigma 1 and d epsilon 1 and on the right hand side uh, you have 1 plus beta and here you have n by epsilon 1. So, we are saying that 1 plus beta and n by epsilon 1. Okay. So, uh, n by epsilon 1 is equal to 1 plus beta. Okay. So, since this is a process happening at instability when necking is start, so you can say epsilon 1 star as well. So, epsilon 1 star is nothing but n by 1 plus beta and epsilon 2 star is nothing but beta into epsilon 1 star which is nothing but beta into n divided by 1 plus beta. Okay. So, assuming that, assuming that your beta is going to remain same even at maximum tension even at maximum tension or during necking, okay, during local necking, during your local necking, is not it? Okay, we are going to assume that beta is going to remain same, but then it may not be true, we will see that. Okay. So, still you will see that you are going to have this particular equation. So, epsilon 1 star will be equal to n by 1 plus beta and epsilon 2 star will be equal to beta into n divided by 1 plus beta. Okay. So, now if you add these two, if you add these two, okay, epsilon 1 star plus epsilon 2 star, you will see that it will be equal to n, it will be equal to n. So, okay, this is a simple condition for your local necking with the help of maximum tension we derived it. Okay. So, with the help of maximum tension we derived it. Okay. So, now this epsilon 1 star and 2 star as we discussed before, these are actually uh, called as forming Okay, limit strains. These are actually called as a forming limit strain. One is major strain, other one is minor strain. Okay, so epsilon one star and two star are strains at maximum tension because it satisfies that maximum tension condition. Okay, and uh, that equation can be drawn in this diagram. Okay, y-axis being epsilon one and x-axis you have epsilon two, two principal strains. And uh, if you plot that particular equation, epsilon one star plus two star is equal to n, it will give you a line like this which is called as maximum tension line and it will meet y axis at n. It will meet y axis at n. Why? Because epsilon 2, if you put 0 here, epsilon 1 will be n in that equation. So, it will meet at n and it is going to have an angle of 45 degree. Okay. So, now, so what is the physical meaning of this line? This line tells that any data point you pick up, any epsilon 1 data you have it here, it is going to tell you that maximum tension is reached when you pick up that particular beta, when you pick up that particular beta. Say for example, when you put okay, beta is equal to minus half, okay, when you put beta is equal to minus half in this equation, okay, beta is equal to minus half, let us say. Okay, here also beta is equal to minus half. If you put, what will happen here? So, your epsilon 1 star will be 2n, epsilon 2 star will be minus n. Okay, so, it is minus n comma 2n is a data point at which you are going to have localized necking if you follow beta is equal to your minus half, if you follow beta is equal to minus half. Okay. So, that is the meaning of this particular line. Okay. Similarly, if you follow any other uh, you know uh, beta value, you will get different place at which you are going to have localized necking. Okay. And uh, it also tells that as long as you are below the line, you are actually in the safe region. As long as you are below the line, you are actually in the safe region. Once you cross this line, that means maximum tension is reached. 
okay local necking is started that would be useful deformation formability is lost so the material will be will not be will be unsafe okay above this so i am writing failed region above the line so this actual maximum tension line actually separates safe strains from failed strains okay so below the line you will have useful forming window so you can deform any sheet you can make any component made of any material okay so if you get this maximum tension line you have to maintain the deformation such that all the strain data points will be below this particular maximum tension line then there is no problem okay but there is one point here so the important point here is when we do experiments uh, when we do actual trials okay and uh, find out uh, this epsilon 1 star and 2 star there is some discrepancy as shown in this particular figure as shown in this particular figure so i think we understand the fact that uh, you know like this kind of you know sheets uh, can be used for different uh, you know strain paths we will discuss about it little later and uh, you will see that uh, all these sheets will have a circle grids on the on its surface of a particular dimension and then uh, you deform the sheet okay say for example here all are deformed at different beta values okay so here probably beta is equal to 1 to this could be beta is equal to 0 plain strain to this could be beta is equal to your uniaxial value whatever you have okay so if you deform it and allow it to fail okay so the circle grids will be converted into ellipses okay and you can measure your limit strains epsilon 1 and 2 closer to the uh, to the neck region and you can get epsilon 1 star and 2 star from this okay from experiments point of epsilon 1 star and 2 star you can get from this okay so and you can compare uh, that all this data okay uh, with respect to maximum tension line as discussed here okay so both uh, both the quadrants you can get uh, for the first quadrant as well as second quadrant so first quadrant okay and second quadrant. one quadrant is beta is greater than 0 the other case is beta is less than 0 okay so beta greater than 0 other one is beta less than 0 so this kind of data points can be compared from experiments as well as from maximum tension line and uh, that will lead to something called as forming limit diagram or forming limit curve it's called forming limit curve flc okay it will tell you the onset of local necking it will tell you onset of local necking okay which means as i told in the previous uh, diagram it will separate safe and failed stains in a sheet okay but when you compare experimental data and maximum tension line as i mentioned okay this is your maximum tension line and your experimental data is given and maximum tension line is given okay and it continues here okay both are shown here maximum tension line and experimental data are put in one graph and they are compared here you will see that or when you say beta is equal to less than zero okay that means uh, minus half zero or in between if you see uh, the experimental data and maximum tension line to some extent coincide well okay so when you go for beta is equal to less than zero experimental flc coincides with maximum tension line mostly there is no issue but on the right hand side okay in this particular stage uh, the right hand side beta greater than zero if you see there is significant difference between your experimental data and your maximum tension line okay so your forming limit curve okay your forming limit curve from experiment does not coincide with maximum tension line that you get from the previous theory okay why something is happening to the growth of neck okay which is not observed in other beta values until now but if you pick up on the right hand side quadrant when beta greater than 0 okay let us say beta is equal to 1 okay beta is equal to 1 would be b, forming limit curve would be somewhere here if you take beta greater than 1 and if you take beta is equal to 1 for example okay so there is something okay that stabilizes the or slows down the growth of neck okay once it reaches once tension reaches a maximum value okay so that stabilization actually delays uh, you know whether uh, your forming limit is reached or not and there could be some more useful deformation safe region okay that can be attained by the material that is why you have large difference or uh, some difference between your maximum tension line and experimental data and the pattern is also different you see the maximum tension line keep on decreasing but on the right hand side you will see there is some increment in your forming limit strain okay so there is some process that delays uh, your uh, or stabilizes or slows down the growth of neck 
okay, once maximum tension is reached. Okay. So, what is that? Okay. So, what is that? That can be uh, understood uh, from this particular analysis. So, uh, this diagram is already known to you. Uh, this diagram is already known to you. We already introduced this to you. So, what we are considering here is a simple sheet, uh, a thin sheet. Okay. And uh, you are seeing that uh, the principal stresses sigma 1 and sigma 2 are mapped here. And I uh, you know uh, your 1 is along this 1 direction, uh, 2 is along 2 direction and uh, it is undergoing deformation and a localized neck is formed here. Localized neck is nothing but this dotted region. This region is nothing but your localized neck. The cross section is shown here. You can see there is a local neck that is formed already formed here. Okay. That region I am calling it as B and outside region I am calling it as A and that is also shown here. Okay. This local region, localized neck region is called as B and outside that region is called as A here and it has got a thickness. Let us assume that the sheet has got a thickness. Okay. We are going to define something called as a theta. Theta is actually the angle between uh, the neck direction and the major principal stress that is sigma 1. Okay. So, now there are certain things that we, uh, we need to uh, understand in this. First one is what we are saying is a local neck as shown in this figure would occur along a line of pre-existing weakness at a limit strain. Okay, in the uniform region that is approximately given by epsilon 1 star and 2 star which is described before. Okay, what does that mean? That means that suppose you take a sheet and you assume that there is an imperfection like we have done before. Okay, then necking is going to happen in the pre-existing weakness let us say for example imperfection. Okay, along that direction it is going to happen and uh, let us imagine that necking is going to happen in that location then epsilon 1 star and 2 star the uniform region is shown as a forming limit strain. Okay. That is the physical meaning of this epsilon 1 star and 2 star and how is it related to this B region is what is given here. Okay. Local neck would occur along a line of pre-existing weakness at a limit strain in the uniform region. Okay. Why? Because the defect is already weaker, it is going to fail first. Okay. So, we are going to have a conservative approach to choose epsilon 1 star and 2 star in the uniform region that is in the A region. Okay. So, now if we identify the uniform region as A and imperfection as B and imperfection meaning that is where necking is going to happen, then certain conditions have to be analyzed, uh, assumed when we do this necking process analysis. What are the conditions I have uh, noted here? Uh, uh, the stress and strain ratios we call alpha and beta must remain constant as assumed in the differentiation before. Okay, before and during the necking process. Basically, alpha and beta should remain throughout the course of deformation, okay, uh, even during necking also, which is not actually true, but let us say it is like this. Then the process is a localized one. The necking process is a localized one. It is going to be there in a particular very small location and the strain distribution outside the location is almost same. Something like that you have to maintain. And uh, the neck must take a form of narrow trough it is not, uh, you know, that is why it is called localized one, okay, narrow trough in the sheet rather than a patch or diffuse region that would influence the conditions away from the neck. So, it is so localized that it should not affect anything happening outside that region, okay, which means that it is going to be a narrow trough, okay. So, now what we are saying is once the necking process becomes severe, okay, so diffuse necking has happened and then now localization is severe, let us say the uniform region A this region A ceases to strain, okay. it will not strain, it will stop straining, okay. which means that the strain increment parallel to the neck in the y direction in the figure, okay. the strain increment parallel to the neck that is along the y direction okay, will be 0. So, I am going to say that along the uh, neck direction that is y, okay. I am going to say that d epsilon y is going to be 0. Okay. So, uh, once the necking process becomes severe, the uniform region A ceases to strain and moreover the strain increment parallel to neck, okay, gradient, strain gradient will develop across the neck. Along the neck, it is going to be, strain increment is going to be 0. So, I am going to write d epsilon y is equal to 0. So, once uh, localized necking is done, we can measure, there are lot of grids on the seat surface. So, you can measure d epsilon y, okay, practically you can measure it and see that, so the increment is going to be 0. Okay. So, now let us go ahead to the next one, there is something called a geometry constraint. Okay. Geometry constraint means 
these two regions are attached to each other, isn't it? So, these two regions A and B are actually attached to each other, right? So, because of this geometric constraint requires that strain increment along the neck, uh, strain increment along the neck must be equal to that in the same direction outside it, okay? That means, uh, if you want to measure D epsilon along neck that is Y in B, that should be equal to the strain increment along the same direction in A also. Why? Because these two are actually constrained. These two are actually connected. These two are actually connected. That means, uh, the strain increment in Y direction both regions A and B along the neck must be 0. So, I am going to say that D epsilon Y A and D epsilon Y B, these two are equal and they become 0, which also in a way tells that my beta is equal to 0 for necking. Okay. So, beta is nothing but D epsilon 2 by 1. Okay. D epsilon 2 by 1. So, here you can say 2 is like you can say y. Okay. So, which also tells a fact that your beta is equal to 0 for localized necking. This indicates that necking neck can develop only along the uh, direction of 0 extension. 0 extension means what? It is along your y direction. In, with respect to this figure, it is along y direction only. In this particular region B, you are going to have a, uh, you know uh, development of neck. Okay. So, with this uh, entire thing from this figure what we are going to do is we are going to relate you can see that uh, there are two uh, coordinates x y and 1 2 we can relate these two okay we can relate strain increments in these two you know uh, axis okay 1 2 and x y by this equation okay so d epsilon y would be equal to d epsilon 1 cos square theta plus d epsilon 2 sin square theta and this would be equal to 0 i am putting a condition now so by putting this condition what i am going to do is i am going to show that when you take beta is equal to 1, that is uh, when you pick up uh, a beta value on the right hand side of this diagram, this particular diagram, on the right hand side of this particular diagram, I am going to say that uh, this uh, direction of 0 extension does not exist. Okay? Whereas, if you put some other condition, for example, in this side, tensile and plane strain, okay, the direction of 0 extension exists. That means, there is some theta, there is some definite theta. This theta actually defines uh, Okay, the angle, isn't it? So, uh, the B region being your neck region and uh, the direction of that along Y is going to define the direction of zero extension, this theta is going to be something which we are going to calculate here. Okay. So, this equation relates uh, uh, your strains uh, in 1, 2 with respect to your x, y and uh, I am using this and this condition is already known to me, d epsilon y has to be 0. Okay, and now what I am going to do is uh, for isotropic material, which is what we are discussing until now, under uniaxial tension, okay, this equation is already derived by us. D epsilon two is equal to D epsilon three. That will be equal to minus D epsilon one by two. We already derived this. Okay, so if you put this condition in this equation, you will see that uh, this equation will give you beta is equal to minus one by two. And if you put it in this equation, it will give theta as about fifty-five degrees. Okay, so, you can uh, get this, I mean somehow you have to bring in beta into this. So, d epsilon 1 divided by d epsilon 1, here also d epsilon 2 by divided by d epsilon 1 you can put. Okay, So, this will become beta, Okay, that beta value if you put it here, you will get theta as about 54.74 degrees. Okay, So, then which means that there is some definite theta, Okay, uh, that means the angle between your uh, direction of zero extension and the principal stress exists in uniaxial. Okay. Now, when you go for plane strain, we know that beta is equal to 0. So, if you put beta is equal to 0 here, okay, that means epsilon 2 by 1 is equal to epsilon 2 by epsilon 1 is equal to 0 here, then you will see that theta is going to be equal to 90 degree, which means uh, the pre existing that uh, your uh, 0 extension line is going to be perpendicular to sigma 1, there also it is existing. Now, if you pick up uh, one case along on, on the right hand side, that is beta greater than 0, okay, let us say beta is equal to 1, I am picking up. If you put beta is equal to 1 here, so cos square theta plus 1 into sin square theta is equal to 0, it is not going to happen. Okay? That means, uh, here theta is actually does not exist, which means that there is no direction in which extension is 0 when you go for right hand side. For example, beta is equal to 1. There is no direction in which extension is 0. So, just to conclude, if there is no direction of 0 extension, for example, in the stretching process in which beta is greater than 0, we took an example of beta is equal to 1. The strain circuit tension is a maximum or still given by epsilon 1 star and 2 star, but geometric constraints prevent the instantaneous growth of neck.
Okay. So, because of that reason, because of no direction of zero extension, okay. For example, when you have beta is equal to one, okay, we say that, uh, okay, uh, so that actually delays the growth of neck or slows down the growth of neck, and hence there are chances that uh, you will have uh, larger strains in actual experimental data, okay, when compared to your maximum tension line. So that is why you have large difference in this particular zone. Beta is greater than zero. Okay. So, this can be explained with this particular simple analysis. Okay. So, now let us uh, go into the details of uh, uh, necking in the biaxial tension, how it is going to happen in the biaxial tension. So, we pick up uh, uh, only one case that is necking in biaxial tension that is on the right hand side of your forming limit curve that is this side, uh, yeah, this side of the forming limit curve. Okay. So, then we are going to this particular region and we are going to say how necking is going to happen, we are going to briefly discuss about it. As discussed before, in the first quadrant of strain diagram, your forming limit diagram, where both principal strains are positive, okay. so there is no direction of zero extension, okay. epsilon 1, epsilon 2 or let us say positive, okay. epsilon 1 will be always positive, but epsilon 2 could be positive or negative. So, we are picking up this particular region where both are positive, there is no direction of zero extension because theta does not exist, that is what we said. However, we say that under biaxial tension experiments, necking occurs actually. Okay, When we do, when you take beta is equal to 0 and deform, material is actually going to neck, but it happens at a strain level beyond the point of maximum tension. That is why you have larger epsilon 1 star and 2 star in the previous figure. Okay, So, now what we are going to do is just to understand little bit more of what is happening in that uh, region, we are going to use this particular schematic. This schematic tells about the biaxial stretching of sheet with the imperfection uniform region. As usual, we are saying that, so this sheet is actually stretched okay, uh, due to sigma 1 and sigma 2, two direction, one direction is defined and as usual, we are defining a region A and a region B. B is a region which is a weaker region which has got a thickness of TB when compared to A, TB is less. Okay, So, here it is TA, here it is TB, TB is lesser than TA. Okay, and deformation is happening okay, and B region is a pre-existing defect and that is where let us say that necking is going to start and we are going to have a simplest case where it is going to be oriented perpendicular to the principal you know, uh, stress that is uh, sigma 1. Okay, B. Okay. So, now the point here is this belongs to same material A, B both belong to same material. Only thing is their thickness is different which is nothing but an imperfection equivalent to all the imperfections in the material. Okay, so, we are going to define something called as F. Okay. The imperfection is a groove denoted as B, where the thickness is TB, it is slightly less than the uniform region TA and it is characterized by a factor F that is called as inhomogeneity factor, TB by TA. We are going to call F is equal to TB by TA. TB by TA is like for example, TA, you take it as let us say 1 mm thick sheet and TB would be let us say 0.9999 mm, very small heterogeneity you are picking up, inhomogeneity factor you are picking up. So, 1 minus F naught, F is nothing but 0 0.001 you can say, something like that you can imagine. Okay. So, uh, I am putting F naught here for a simple reason that it is at the start of the deformation, it is at the start of the deformation initial one, let us say, which means that there are chances that during course of deformation, during necking, this F can slightly change. Okay. So, as discussed in the previous section, strain in the region B, okay. strain in the region B, B is your this region, strain in the region B parallel to the groove would be constrained by the uniform region A and I can say epsilon 2 B would be equal to epsilon 2 A, epsilon 2 B. Okay. So, that is 2, okay. epsilon 2 B that is along this direction, these two regions are going to have same strain along two directions, epsilon 2e, 2a is equal to epsilon 2b. Okay. So, uh, and the process is going to be a proportional process for the uniform region. Okay. So, in the groove region, neck region, we do not know. So, for the uniform region, we are saying that you are going to have sigma 1a, sigma 2a, which is nothing but alpha naught in sigma 1a. Again, I am using alpha naught, not alpha. Okay. 
because it's the initial one, let us say, on the uniform region, and sigma 3a is going to be 0, plain stress. Epsilon 1a will be there, 2a will be there, alpha naught will give you beta naught, and epsilon 3a is nothing but minus of 1 plus beta naught into epsilon 1a, which we already know. Okay. So, now this T1 is nothing but sigma 1a Ta, which is nothing but sigma 1b in Tb, correct? It will be transmitted to both the regions A and B and uh, this will lead to this particular equation, we can say Tb by Ta, which is what we want. Tb by Ta would be equal to sigma 1a divided by sigma 1b, which is nothing but my f okay. or you can say f naught also, nothing wrong in it, definition remains same. Okay. So, Tb by Ta is nothing but df, which is nothing but sigma 1a divided by sigma 1b. Okay. So, you can see the relationship okay, where Tb is generally smaller than Ta. So, accordingly sigma 1a and sigma 1b are related. Okay. So, now deformation is happening with these constraints and this is what will happen here. Okay. The same figure can be referred. So, we are going to put uh, one particular first stage for example. So, here is an yield locus is plotted sigma 1 versus sigma 2 a red one is the initial yield locus you can say. Okay. So, now consider initial yielding okay. the entire material is going to yield. The material has got a definite yield strength let us say sigma f naught. Okay. So, now you are going to deform beyond uniaxial yield strength. Okay. What will happen is the groove region that is this B region will reach yield point first. Okay. Uh, because why? Because your sigma 1b is greater than sigma 1a, correct? So, your sigma 1b okay, is greater than sigma 1a. Sigma 1b is greater than sigma 1a. So, because it has to, it is a weaker region. Okay, Sigma 1b is greater than sigma 1a for f less than 1, which is what we generally take for f less than 1. So, the groove will reach or uh, the imperfect region B will reach yield point first. Why? Because your sigma 1B will be greater than sigma 1A. So, now the point is the material in the groove cannot deform because of the geometric constraint epsilon 2B equal to epsilon 2A because of that what will happen is as the stress in A increases to reach the yield locus. Okay. Now, A point will also start going in the same direction like that of B and it will also reach your uh, you know uh, yield locus by the time what will happen the point representing the region B must move around the yield locus to B naught. Okay. So, you will see that when uniform region is deforming and reach yield locus by the time what will happen is the B would slightly rotate and it will go to B naught this itself indicates the fact that your alpha is not going to be same okay. your, it is going to be alpha alpha naught is going to be changed to your alpha. Okay. So, uh, though we say it is a proportional process, here itself you will see that uh, okay, the uniform region and uh, the groove region are not going to have same alpha, it is going to be slightly different. Why? Because your sigma 1b is going to be larger than sigma 1a. Okay, so, this is the situation. Now, what will happen is now what you are going to, you are going to further deform the sheet. Considering some increment in deformation, okay, you are further deforming it. Okay for which increments parallel to the groove must be same, correct. So, d epsilon 2 a would be equal to d epsilon 2 b, right, which is what we have seen before also, okay. d epsilon 2 a would be equal to d epsilon 2 b, d epsilon 2 a, okay. So, here, here, okay, these two should be, the increment should be same, why? Because they are connected to each other. So, this situation, what I am going to do, I am going to draw it in a vector diagram like this. So, I am going to say that your d epsilon 2 a and d epsilon 2 b is represented by okay, this length and uh, my sigma 1 a is represented by this and sigma 1 b is represented by this okay. and uh, your uh, a region is characterized by beta naught because of alpha naught and your b region is uh, characterized by beta corresponding to alpha. Okay. And uh, you can see that your epsilon 1 b is greater than epsilon 1a quite naturally why because your sigma 1b is greater than sigma 1a as per the previous discussion. Okay. Your sigma 1b would be greater than sigma 1a okay. and because of that okay, your epsilon d epsilon 1b will be greater than d epsilon 1a okay. uh, and uh, all the four strains can be vectors can be increment can be represented in this particular diagram. 
So, the strain increments across the groove will be greater than that in the uniform region and inhomogeneity will become greater. So, F will also change during the course of deformation okay. and uh, as shown in the figure above, you will see that your d epsilon 1 b is greater than d epsilon 1 a. Okay. This can be directly interpreted from this relationship, sigma 1 b is greater than sigma 1 a and that can be represented with this uh, diagram. Right. So, now what will happen is, uh, so it is clear that in the B region, the strain in the groove okay, or in the neck in the B region will increase ahead of that in the uniform region, but only slightly while the tension is increasing. Okay. So, you slowly deform the material, tension is increased, you will see that uh, little bit ahead in B, strains will be little bit ahead in B. Why? Because uh, your sigma 1 B is going to be larger. Okay. But now, this particular effect, the difference is going to gradually accelerate after the tension reaches a maximum. Okay. So, the growth of epsilon 1 in the uniform region and in the neck region or in the groove region, okay, if that difference is going to accelerate, okay, when it will accelerate and uh, if it reaches a tension at a maximum and continues till the groove reaches a state of plane strain beta is equal to 0, which is what is shown in this particular figure. So, it is the same figure, you will see that it is a plot between sigma 1 and sigma 2 okay. and uh, uh, th this situation is already known to us, initial yield locus is there and this point okay, is for A and it will slightly rotate for B and because of that there will be some change in alpha okay, with respect to alpha naught, okay. but if you further deform it and uh, once you uh, tension crosses maximum tension, Okay. What will happen here is you will reach a state of plane strain, which is what we have seen in the previous analysis also. Okay. So, uh, like this, which we have seen in the previous one also, like for example, beta is equal to 0, I said for necking will happen. So, here also you will see that uh, slowly the beta value will tend to move towards uh, this particular point where uh, your alpha is going to be half, which is nothing but beta is equal to 0. Okay, so, it will reach a state of plane strain, which is shown in this particular figure. Okay, but in the case of A, it is not so. In the case of A, okay, this is for your A not A point, A location, it is not so like that. Okay. So, when plane strain is reached at B F, this particular F basically says that it is going to fail. Okay. B location is going to fail. Okay. The strain parallel to the groove ceases. The strain parallel to the groove ceases. The same thing has been represented in the strain diagram epsilon 1 versus epsilon 2. You will see that. So, the strain parallel to the groove means you are 2. Okay. You are 2 if you see it is actually going to stop here. Okay. Like in the previous vector diagram, I am saying epsilon 2 a star comma epsilon 2 b star. Epsilon 2 a star, this is epsilon 2 b star. Both are plotted here you will see that in the A region, okay, it will go up to a particular extent, okay, up to up to this particular stage, okay, both B and A are going to remain same, almost same, but uh, after some time you will see that there is an unstable increase in B, that is why you will see that uh, it is going to suddenly increase uh, when compared to A, but A keeps on straining, uniform region keeps on straining further here and uh, when epsilon 2 A comma B reaches star, that means uh, when it reaches your limit strain, you will see that these two points will also reach its star value that is limit strain is actually reached. When plane strain is reached at B f, the strain parallel to the groove ceases because that is actually plane strain. Okay. So, along the groove it is going to be 0, but in the thickness direction and perpendicular to the groove there will be some gradient. Okay. The groove will then continue until failure or tearing and the strain in the uniform region totally ceases. Okay. So, you will have more strain localization only in the groove region okay, to have a localized necking and material is going to tear apart after that. If the localization is not there, it means that the strain is getting localized somewhere else also. Okay, Then you have to be little bit careful that out of these two, whichever is weaker is going to dominate and material will fail here. Okay, So, now you will this particular diagram, you will see that uh, your uh, epsilon 2 star is going to be same. Okay. Why? Because it is along the groove region, 1A is going to be much smaller as compared to 1B. Okay. 1A is going to be smaller than 1B. 
okay so now this uh, 1b if you look at and 1a if you see this 1b strain is going to be several values larger than this okay maybe like 4 times 10 times larger than with respect to a okay so the strain state just outside the neck is of interest so that epsilon 1 a star and 2 a star when failure occurs can be estimated and can be called as forming limit strain for a particular alpha naught and beta naught okay so which means that this b region will undergo unstable increase in your uh, you know uh, in your epsilon 1 okay but you will see that this a region is not like that it's going to be very uniform strain and uh, you will see that 2 a and b is almost same it is along the groove and uh, this particular diagram tells a fact that when localized necking happens the reference is actually in the a region only the reference is actually in the a region only so that epsilon 1 a star comma epsilon 2 a star becomes a forming limit strain okay becomes a forming limit strain okay b region we do not choose because b region is already a neck to zone so just to have a conservative approach you pick up a, a location just closer to the neck but in the uniform region and call that as a forming limit strains so, uh, theoretically you can predict like this so uh, in the biaxial you know deformation necking has got uh, these many stages okay so uh, initially you will see that uh, it's going to uh, the groove region or the B region is going to reach E locus by when A reaches B will get rotated in this way. So, B naught A naught are represented this itself tells that alpha is going to be different and sigma 1B is greater than sigma 1A because sigma 1B is greater than sigma 1B then D epsilon 1A is going to be greater than D epsilon 1, 1B is greater than D epsilon 1A which can also be represented in this uh, uh, strain plot which tells that uh, your uh, uh, strain increment in B is going to grow ahead of A. Okay and uh, once maximum tension is reached around that particular situation you will see that uh, in the b region uh, the beta is going to actually switch or tend towards a plane strain type of deformation and which means that plane strain means the strain along the neck region parallel to the groove or along the neck region ceases okay which means uh, you are going to put more strains in the other two directions okay so you further deform it uh, the uh, groove will or the neck region will uh, further continue to deform it will fail it will tear okay and the strain in the uniform region actually ceases okay but we always refer uniform region okay when this situation is happening okay and uh, that will lead to epsilon 1 a star epsilon 1 a star and epsilon 2 a star to show at forming limit strains okay so uh, now uh, if you try to get strain rate in these two regions okay let us say uh, you know in the uh, a region and in the b region if you compare strain rates because strain is larger for a common time you will see that uh, strain rate in the b region is going to be you know several uh, it's going to be a multiplication factor it's going to be large much much larger than uh, the uh, limit strains or the strain rates in the a region okay because strain is large for a common time you will see that the strain rate also would be larger in the neck region as compared to A. Okay? So, maybe like 4 times, you know, 8 times, 10 times would be larger than in A. So, this can be used as a uh, measure for, uh, you know, localized necking. Okay? So, now let us assume that you are getting epsilon 1A and 2A stars, okay, which is going to denote a forming limit strain okay, by following alpha naught and beta naught. Alpha naught and beta naught are the initial uh, stress ratio and strain ratio that you have picked up and deform the sheet. Now you got forming limit strains now. Okay, so now you have to repeat the same strategy for various various values of alphas and betas. Okay, so then you will get uh, different data points uh, in your forming limit curve. Okay, different data points mainly on the right hand side of forming limit curve. Let us imagine. So you will get uh, this first star. You will get the second star. You will get this uh, third star. Okay, these three points. Let us say epsilon one star and two star will give you. If you join it, it will give you a locus that will give you the forming limit curve on the right hand side. On the left hand side, we are still assuming that your maximum tension line is sufficient uh, to get the, uh, the forming limit. Okay, so, on the left hand side is nothing but a maximum tension line, uh, you know, which you can get it from epsilon 1 star plus 2 star is equal to n. 
combinedly these two lines this maximum tension line and on the right hand side you repeat the same strategy for different values of alpha and beta and you get epsilon 1 star and 2 star and you plot together this entire curve is called as a forming limit curve in short it is called as a FLC. Okay, so FLC is going to tell you when localized necking is actually going to start. So, which also tells the fact that below this curve you are actually in the safe zone. When you cross this you are going to be a little bit careful the material can fail all is already it is already failed you have to be careful with this. So, when you are as long as you are below this curve you will be safe. Okay. Sometimes you can also uh, define band for this. Okay. Band this type of band can be defined which means that there is a transit zone. Okay. So, below this lower line it is safe above this curve it is definitely failure but you are in the transit zone okay, which tells the fact that you have to be careful moment you enter into this particular zone at any time it may reach actual forming limit curve. Okay. So, forming limit curve essentially is uh, nothing but it is actually uh, what is it is a locus of all the limit strains in different alphas and betas, different alphas and betas okay. and uh, like your stress strain behavior it is a material property, it is a material property. Okay. So, you change something in the material then it will change otherwise it is not going to change. Okay. Uh, say for example, you do some heat treatment your forming limit can change, you do some material processing like uh, you know friction stir welding then your forming limit can change otherwise uh, it is not going to change. Okay. Uh, so, what are the applications of forming limit curve? Okay. So, failure diagnosis of your uh, you know sheet grades. Okay. So, when it can fail, what type of fracture, Okay. all those things you can understand from this. Quality of sheet estimation, so whether the material has got is a good quality with respect to forming limit or not that is the main thing. Okay. So, maybe material is good in terms of corrosion, but in terms of forming limit whether it is good or not we do not know. So, that can be estimated and uh, you can select a particular sheet grade for a particular component. Okay. Suppose, you want to make a sheet component uh, used in uh, let us say aerospace structures or automotive structures okay, or even tube also. Okay. So, you want to select okay, then okay, it has to have a minimum forming limit to make that component that is the meaning. What does that mean? That means, if you make a component out of a particular material let us say stainless steel then in none of the locations in none of the locations in that component it can cross the forming limit curve. The stains can cross the forming limit curve it is not allowed. Okay. It means that uh, suppose if you want to make a uh, you know a cup a little bit a complex cup which is used for some automotive application okay, then you will you will have a big machine and then you have a die punch set up for that and you do it in shop floor you can get that part and uh, uh, you, you can locally check visually you can check okay, whether there is any localized necking starts or there is severe thinning okay. and if you measure epsilon 1 and 2 in that location by, put, by putting some circle grids of course, before deformation you have to put that and deform it and measure it in the location then that will give you some idea of what is the value of epsilon 1 and 2 with respect to a forming limit curve of that particular material which means uh, before going for component uh, uh, level uh, you know uh, your uh, you know st uh, your stage Okay, you need to get forming limit of that particular stainless steel for example. Okay. So, that SS let us say SS uh, you know uh, stainless steel some, some grade is there of particular thickness 2 mm you need to have forming limit curve for that. Standard methods can be used and you have to evaluate and in none of the locations in that actual component stain can cross the forming limit curve. Okay. And uh, you will see that in actual component uh, you know at any location you pick up it is going to be one of the alphas or betas or in between. We have already seen five different alphas and betas right from uh, you know your uh, the least in the second quadrant to your first quadrant right. So, in the sheet component you will see uh, so from this quadrant to this quadrant you already uh, you have seen that. So, now uh, in the actual component you will see that it will follow one of this uh, stain or co combination of all the stain paths that is why this forming limit curve is going to be important it tells actually the uh, necking strains or the forming limit strains at various stain paths which a component can uh, can follow during the course of uh, manufacturing. Okay. So, in none of the locations it can cross uh, this particular forming limit curve. So, which means uh, the selection of material can be done for a particular component using this forming limit curve. Okay. Suppose, this is a forming limit curve of one material and you make a component and you will see that one particular critical location uh, the stain has crossed this and it has reached here this particular point which means that the material is actually component has already failed okay, and you cannot make that component with that material. 
So either you change the material or you change the process conditions. Okay, you are not, uh, you know, uh, it's not affordable for you to change the material. Let us say, then you change the process conditions such that the same material you can make that component, which also tells the fact that selection of process conditions such as lubrication, forming temperature, strain rate can be decided based on this particular forming limit curve. Okay, so now here I have made a note. The shape of forming limit curve depends on number of material properties and on the initial inhomogeneity factor that is your F chosen, theoretical, theoretically. Okay, so it depends on you have to assume an initial F to get a forming limit curve theoretically. So it is said that your forming limit curve depends on F also. We will see that in due course how F is going to affect the forming limit curve. Okay, by showing some schematics of forming limit curve, you will see that. Okay, so we stop here and then we will discuss in the next session. Mm -hmm.